welcome to this installation of Music in the Museum. My name is Ellie Moseman and I am one of the curators at the Alucard Museum and I'm also a professor of modern art history in the Department of Art and Art History. We are in this space to celebrate contemporary art by women from the permanent collection of the Alucard Museum. Curating is really about an investigation and thinking about structures of a particular culture. In this exhibition, we'd like for you to think about whose work is privileged, whose work might be missing. A museum's collection is one type of archive, and in this case, we should be thinking about what the role of an archive might be. What does it mean to display just a selection of work from an archive? As the famous feminist art historian Linda Nochlin pointed out a generation ago, at a moment when all disciplines are becoming more self-conscious, more aware of the nature of their presuppositions as exhibited in the very languages and structures of the various fields of scholarship, uncritical acceptance of what is as natural may be intellectually fatal. And those are Linda Nochlin's words. We are thinking about what the implications might be for an all-women exhibition of art in the year 2020. The all-women show is fraught and has a fraught history, which may marginalize the work of female-identified artists. And yet, it can be another structure thrown up by institutions that prevents artists from experiencing a level playing field. And yet, we as curators are proud of the diversity of mediums that are found in this show, and we're excited to share these compelling works with our audience. We're also aware that more could be done to increase the diversity of mediums, of cultural backgrounds, of gender identities and ethnicities that are represented within the Alucard's collection. And action is already being taken to add stimulating and diverse works to that very same collection. And we're very pleased to bring you a number of works from the Alucard's storerooms and to bring them to light. So I'd like to talk with you a little bit about how we have arranged the exhibition. We've deliberately grouped works of art together in uh, categories that hopefully will provide some intellectual stimulation as well as visual stimulation. Along the entry wall, we see a work by Marisol and a work of ceramic sculpture by Betty Woodman. And the pairing of the colors and the, the splashiness and free uh, effect of the colors mixing is something that we found really enticing as a counterpart to the more formal and uh, geometric effects of color in Bridget Riley's uh, print called Going Across, um, which we have next to a work by Krissa, which includes experimental work with neon. And Krissa is one of the pioneers who has been working with neon since the 1960s. And she died only in 19, excuse me, in 2013. In the view shed, as you enter into the museum space, you see directly across from you a work by Jenny Holzer, which was originally displayed as individual sheets of brightly colored paper with her famous, now famous, inflammatory essays emblazoned on them in black lettering. And these were originally pasted around in the New York subway and then occasionally gathered together and shown in much larger groups, and this is one of these groupings. Uh, this uh, word play features uh, critical looks at culture and the ways that uh, our assumptions as a culture can be undercut by examining closely the types of stereotypes and expectations that we have and the ways that these kinds of expectations bubble up through the culture and start to create uh, rigid categories that really could be toppled the more we examine the, the types of assumptions that we work with in our daily lives. This piece by Jenny Holzer is part of a series that we've hung where we have critical investigations of the social sphere. And we have, for example, 
Isa Lisa Atia's Veil of Ignorance and Kim Gordon's Dead Machines and Sharon Sutton's Silk Stockings and Candlelit Cafes as well as Kara Walker's Boo Hoo. All of these works are using word and hue as a way to critically engage with social expectations, with categorization, with stereotype, and critically examining that and attempting to undercut that. The next series down the wall is a sequence where we have some works that are surprisingly representative and abstract at the same time. Anne-Marie Junier and Alain Claret's uh, work called Villa Arson comes across at first as abstraction and upon closer examination becomes the very most realistic uh, rooftops that you could possibly imagine. And this boundary between abstraction and representation and the ways in which objects which are commonplace, whether that is rooftops or light bulbs, seem to skirt the boundary between representation and the knowable and abstraction and perhaps something that lies beyond what we know in our visceral lives and um, creates access into the world of the imaginary. Along the wall further still, we have a set of figural works by Alice Neal, a pioneer of portraiture, and uh, Beth Van Hosen, both of whom are examining the figure from different standpoints. Perhaps age and ageism comes to mind here. Then we have the pairing of femininity and its opposite, or perhaps its most blatant level. We have Pippolotti Reist's uh, cutout work called The Help, paired together with Kendon North's um, work called Descent, where the flowing gown of a, of a woman who is submerged in water uh, creates ripples and oscillating forms. And then Stena Vasulka's video work along the far wall fronts our next grouping together with Anna Sluharakis and her work, uh, which investigates language as a form of coding and questioning how meaning can be brought about through investigation of words. In the entry sh view shed, we have a work by Rima Gerlovina and Valerie Gerlovine called Serpent. And this is a set of work, this is the beginning of a set of works that features a number of animal forms, perhaps merged as hybrid human and animal forms, or animal forms that morph into other animal forms. This is a grouping that we have deliberately pulled together around the idea of surrealism and the workings of the unconscious, and perhaps its more contemporary variant, which often is called neo-surrealism. And these kinds of investigations of the animal world merging with the human world um, are food for thought, especially in light of the fact that women throughout history have oftentimes been aligned with nature, whereas um, the opposing binary of the masculine has been associated with culture. And this grouping is really intended to call those kinds of binaries and pairings of nature and culture into question. Alongside of that grouping, you'll see a set that humorously pokes fun at domesticity. So the famous gallerist Betty Parsons created a sculpture called Village Shop in 1981, and this is a humorous take on the impenetrability of the domestic space. This is humorously paired with Sarah Zay's Near Sight and Far Sight, which have illustrations showing the most imaginative and perhaps wildly unusual views into domestic spaces and um, different ways in which we can configure reality from irreality. Susan Hall's hilarious screen print called Ironing pits abstraction and the domestic and high art and the daily in a critical look at some of the most mundane housework that's oftentimes, or at least historically oftentimes, has been placed on the tables of women's work. 
So ironing becomes a dialogue between art and abstraction and the daily grind of house chores. Jessica Stockholder's neon work with your salad is a humorous take on perhaps the most mundane thing we do each day, which is eating our veggies and thinking through health and what we do to keep ourselves sustained. This grouping closes with the contemplative work of Anna Bogatin and her painting called Juliet. And this is a work that has a way of asking questions about the quintessential narrative from historical mythology about women giving themselves over to love and love being the be all end all which is worth dying for and this kind of stereotype perhaps of where women are expected to give of themselves to the nth degree and the quietude and the peacefulness of Anna Bogatin's painting is paired with that tragic element that's conjured in the title and as you wrap the corner around to Suhlarkis's um, wordplay it is you have a sense of the different possibilities that are brought about through abstraction so these are some of the groupings that we have been thinking about in terms of ways to understand some of the work of women identified artists from the permanent collection and we really hope that you uh, get something out of examining each of these closely. Thanks so much. Hello, my name is Cyan Ternotsky, and I am an associate professor of new media in the Department of Art and Art History at Colorado State. If you're unfamiliar with new media as an art form, these artworks are created using new media technologies, and some examples are experimental video and experimental animation, artworks that use code and chants, sound art, serious video games, robotics, even biotechnology. In this second part to the visual arts edition of Music in the Museum, I wanted to talk about three artists whose inspiring work falls within the new media realm. The first work I wanted to discuss is an artwork by Kim Gordon entitled Dead Machines, completed in 2018. This work was a gift to the Gregory Alicar from Francisco Leal, Associate Professor in Colorado State's Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. Kim Gordon is an American artist, musician, singer, songwriter, and the co-founding bassist of the experimental rock band Sonic Youth. Emerging from the experimental no-wave art and music scene in New York, Sonic Youth originally launched in 1981. A profound and important influence on the alternative and indie rock movements, Gordon's band produced 16 studio albums and became known worldwide until they disbanded in 2011. Before launching her rock and roll career, in the 1970s, Gordon studied art at the Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles. Her first solo exhibition was a gallery in New York in 1981, and she's continued to make art across multiple disciplines in the years since. Gordon's piece in this exhibition comes from her ongoing noise painting series, depicting the names of experimental and noise groups. Dead Machines is a digital print on paper done in 2018 and references the husband and wife duo of John Olson and Tova O'Rourke. The duo sound is a unique brand of disintegrated electronic noise. The symmetry of Gordon's work is found in the fact that Gordon's own music was an early influence on the Dead Machines, and Gordon's inclusion of this band in her noise painting series speaks to the supportive and grassroots nature of the punk alternative rock scene. The second work in this exhibition that I'd like to discuss is Stena's Six Rotations. This digital video was completed as part of an installation in the Gregory Alicar Museum in 2013 and gifted to the museum by the artist. Stena Valsuka is one of the New Media's art's most important pioneers. Born Stena Bjarndotter, she was born in Reykjavik and trained as a classical musician and violinist. She was originally a member of the Iceland Symphony Orchestra. Stena met her partner Woody Valsuka when she was studying in Prague. Both were interested in performance and films, 
So Stena and Witty moved to New York uh, where they dedicated themselves to video and performance. And in 1971, they founded The Kitchen, an experimental performance space in Greenwich Village. The Kitchen, which is still around today, was one of the very first American institutions to embrace the emerging fields of video and performance while presenting visionary new work in established disciplines such as dance, music, literature, and film. This work is founded on video footage that Stena took on a trip to Iceland. Once edited, the footage was manipulated through very sophisticated code. Stena experimented with different permutations of the process video, exploring the tension between technology and visual imagery. As Stena says, it always starts with me trying to be, you know, mind over matter. You know, me trying to impose my divine vision onto the machine. And when I succeed, I always come home with trivia because my mind isn't that interesting. But if I decide to have matter over mind and keep this dialogue open, I can get quite interesting. Interesting paradoxical images that I will then be able to use in my work. The motivation's always to do your vision, and then it's a matter of compromise. The more you compromise, the luckier you get. That's my rule. The third and final work I'd like to discuss tonight is Pipilotti Risks the Help. Primarily known as a video and installation artist, this particular work is interesting in the unusual format of cutout four color print on fabric. A gift of Polly and Mark Addison, this work was completed in 2004. Born in Switzerland, Rist's work is known for its lush, colorful visuals, and most often with Rist herself as a subject. Influenced by mass media like MTV and ads, her work is sensual, almost always with a physical body as a subject of the work. Moving away from work played on TV screens or monitors, Rist has created massive installations with multiple projectors projecting onto walls, ceilings, and sometimes floors. While many experimental video pioneers went before her, Rist's very accessible and aesthetically compelling work is often credited with bringing video into the mainstream of contemporary art. Rist describes herself as a feminist in political terms, but she says personally she is not. To quote her, for me, the image of a woman in my art does not stand for woman, she stands for all humans. I hope a young guy can take as much from my art as any woman. The help is like Rist's video work in its exuberant colors. Red throughout, the red of menses, the red of childbirth. The color red can represent sin, hellfire, or the devil. But red can also connotate martyrdom or the blood of Christ. Also in this work, a halo, like the type found in traditional iconography, is around the figure's head. The figure, by the way, is an image of Rist herself. Invoking the idea of woman sacrifice, this work is a further study on Rist's theme of the ordinary person, the audience member, the every woman, finding themselves in a position of power and finding themselves with the ability to disseminate. What's exciting about these three works is that they're done by powerful and important pioneers. The works from the museum's collection are exciting and diverse in a variety of mediums. Hello and welcome to the fall virtual program for Music at the Museum concert series. I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about the music you'll be hearing that's paired with the other 50% contemporary art by women with a focus on gender equality. The program you'll be hearing today was written um, all by female composers and it's a, a big span of female composers. You'll be hearing from some early American female composers and then some contemporary composers. Um, unfortunately, Female composers are not widely represented in the classical music canon, and that is for a variety of reasons. Some are that when much of classical music was being written, women were expected to stay at home. They weren't encouraged to go out and seek a education, a music education, higher levels of education. Um, it was also, if you happen to be born into 
an upper class family, uh, you were sort of relegated to parlor music and house concerts and things like that. And that was respectable, but going out and playing um, piano in orchestra concerts or conducting, certainly these were not things that were expected or even accepted by women. Um, so unfortunately, we as classical musicians are limited with what is out there and you have to work kind of hard to find some of that that music so we've done that for you today you'll be hearing um from a variety of female composers we'll start with amy marcy beach who was a pianist and composer that was um, born in the united states and lived in boston she married well and she had a very supportive husband she was born in 1867 so she did not live in a time where there were many women that were out there promoting their works. She was able to do so, especially after her husband passed away. So we have um, several of her pieces tonight. Uh, John Carlo Pierce, uh, our wonderful tenor on faculty, will be singing three of her pieces, two of which are in German. Um, and at that time, the turn of the century, it wasn't uncommon for composers of any nationality to write in German. So that's a special treat. And then um, I'll be performing with Chris Kranz on piano for one of them, uh, her three Browning songs, uh, text by Robert Barrett Browning. Then we sort of shift gears a little bit. One of her contemporaries, Rebecca Clark, who was a British American violist, will be hearing Margaret Miller and Tim Burns play a beautiful piece called Morpheus by Rebecca Clark. She was a very accomplished violist. She um, grew up in England. Uh, she had an American parent, so she had dual citizenship, but then she settled in the United States later in life. She lived a bit longer than um, Amy Beach. Amy Beach lived to um, 1944, where Rebecca Clark lived to 1979. So um, she got to see a little bit more evolution of how this country treated women. Um, and so her work has been certainly newly promoted as we're looking to diversify the, the music that we perform. Then you'll be hearing from some living contemporary composers. You'll hear Leslie Stewart and Ju Hyun Lee perform Chen Yi's piece for violin and piano. Um, Chen Yi is a Chinese American composer um, and she writes for a variety of um, instrumentation. It's wonderful. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. And then finally, you'll be hearing uh, Wes Kenny conducting the University Symphony with Cindy McTee's piece, Einstein's Dream. Cindy McTee and Chen Yi actually born the same year, 1953. Um, and Cindy McTee is on faculty at the University of North Texas. And um, it'll it's exciting to hear sort of this evolution of um, early American female composers and now a more standard people are performing this music they're working on faculty so we wanted to highlight the evolution of female composers in uh, the United States and um, of course a mention of how this exhibit was meant to promote the anniversary of the 19th amendment and I think it's interesting to look at the variety of female American composers and what their reality was um, starting in you know, the late 19th century and moving to current day. So uh, we look forward to sharing this music with you. Thank you so much. That's all. 
Thank you. 